I'd have to say this is the devil's fuel. It's the devil's fuel. And if the world continues to extract and burn coal as it is today, this world will be changed into one hellfire. Welcome to another Climate Emergency Forum. My name is Charles, and I'll be your host for this program. Today, we'll be discussing mountaintop removal, or MTR for short. MTR in the United States is most often associated with the extraction of coal in the Appalachian Mountains in the states of Kentucky, Virginia, West Virginia, and Tennessee. Note that MTR is one among three forms of a broad category of mining referred to as surface mining. The other forms include strip mining and open pit mining. Surface mining involves the removal of a layer of soil and rock overlying a mineral deposit, which in this case is a coal seam. The layer that is removed is referred to as the overburden. Surface mining is in contrast to underground mining in which the overlying rock is left in place and the mineral is removed through shafts or tunnels. Focusing on mountaintop removal, this involves the topographical alteration or removal of a summit, hill, or ridge to access buried coal seams. Now that's a rather mild way of saying mining companies literally blow the tops off mountains to reach thin seams of coal. They then dump millions of tons of rubble into the seams and valleys below the mining site. Toxic heavy metals such as cadmium, selenium, and arsenic leach into local water supplies, poisoning drinking water. All the blasting and moving of overburden sends carcinogenic toxins like silica into the air, affecting communities for miles around. This also destroys the beautiful biodiverse forests and wildlife habitat, increases the risk of flooding and wipes out entire communities. Although now used less often, mountaintop removal mining is still employed in West Virginia. Wikipedia cites a source that said by 2010, an area of over 1.4 million acres or 5,700 square kilometers has undergone this process. Note that this is an amount of land area that exceeds the state of Delaware. More than 500 mountains in the U.S. have been destroyed by this process, resulting in the burial of 3,200 kilometers or 2,000 miles of streams. Michael Hendricks has an excellent TED Med talk, which he did in 2017, that discusses the health consequences of this practice, which will link in the description. Okay, and now I'd like to turn it over to Peter. Thanks, Giles. That was an interesting and um, uh, very upsetting description of what's going on. I was shocked just a year ago when I um, read from the International Energy Agency, uh, actually it was 2020, their report called Coal. I learned that um, around the year 2000, coal production and consumption just took off and reached an all-time high in 2010. Now, I was shocked and interested in that because that was at the time when a lot of climate scientists and people said that, well, coal's over, it's finished, we're never going to get on this worst-case scenario by burning coal. Uh, the IEA, which is a good source of information, proved that's wrong. Not only that, but it stayed on an all-time high until 2020. When I say an all-time high, I mean it's like three or four times what it was in year 2000, actually four times as high. 
So the situation globally with coal is horrendous. It, it, I mean, how does one express, you know, uh, the um, mountaintop coal mining and, and the continued huge coal industry? I'd have to say this is the devil's fuel. It's the devil's fuel. And if the world continues to extract and burn coal as it is today, this world will be changed into one hellfire. I mean, it really will. I mean, look what's happening around the world right now. When the mountaintop program was proposed, I thought, oh, this is an American topic. But, but I should check. I should check and see whether anything's happening in Canada. I'm sure nothing's happening in Canada. Oh, my God, I was wrong. Because in my province of British Columbia, we have this kind of coal removal in the Elk Valley, which is otherwise a very beautiful place, apparently. It's been going on for 120 years. It produces a huge amount of metallurgical coal. And by the way, um, Vancouver, I think, is still the world's top port of export for metallurgical coal. That's British Columbia, too. So there are currently four of these mines still going on in the Elk Valley. And then, shock of shocks, I found there were three or four opposed new coal mining with metallurgical coal in the pipeline in the process of review in British Columbia. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. We should all be getting very, very angry and upset about climate change, but we should be getting more than angry and upset about uh, the continued coal industry. I, I mean, we've all known, I mean, I remember James Hansen going into it. We've all known that we had to stop coal 100% completely, right? If there's any chance of mitigating climate change or stabilizing the climate. And here we are in 2023, and it's still going on worse than ever. Uh, China alone has 160 new coal mines in the process. 160 new ones. Okay, that was less than 400 than it had a few years ago. But there should be no coal mining going on at all in this planet. So I think that's the best that I can say about it. Thank you, Peter, for uh, that uh, information. And yeah, the Elk Valley in BC and four new mines on the way. Well, wow, that's quite a um, piece of information. And, uh, you know, and, and you mentioned that it's used primarily for metallurgical purposes. I guess they make coke out of it to produce steel, I presume, and they export that to different uh, countries for that purpose. And so, Paul, I'm wondering if you can share what you've learned about this mountaintop removal mining. Thank you, Charles, and thank you, Peter. A number of years ago, I read a book called Clean Coal. You know, I was just curious as to see. That's the title of the book. And, you know, to me, it seems a bit like an oxymoron, clean coal. But it mentioned how mountaintop mining had a lot of advantages over traditional underground mining for coal. And more recently, what got me to suggest this uh, topic of mountaintop removal is I read John Grissom's uh, novel called Grey Mountain, which was published in 2014. It's a good novel. Uh, a young woman, a couple of years out of law school, working at a large Wall Street firm, was laid off and had the opportunity to go for a year to the Appalachians to work in a small legal clinic. And she ended up learning all about the mountaintop industry and coal removal. Uh, and she ended up joining the nonprofit law firm, which was mostly catering to local people who were affected by the mining industry. And she ended up fighting against the uh, big coal producers. So it's an excellent story. And often I find that there's lots to learn from fiction novels. I never used to read that much. And now I generally have a fiction and a nonfiction going at the same time. There's more and more fiction novels coming out about our climate dystopian future. And we can probably have a whole show on that. But anyway, yeah, I mean, imagine you're blowing the top off of a mountain. You're reducing, say, 120 meters typically or 400 feet off the top of the mountain. You expose a coal seam. You push all of the rubble, as you said, into the valleys, uh, blocking all of the streams. And the trees on the mountaintop are either burned or 
just push down the side of the mountain. You extract the coal from the seam and then you repeat the process because there's usually multiple seams. There are horizontal layers of coal on the mountain and you do it three or four or five times and you've removed a couple thousand feet off of the top of the mountain, completely changing the topography. And imagine, as you said, this being done to over 500 mountains in the U.S., uh, mostly in the Appalachians. Mostly it's West Virginia and Eastern Kentucky where you get most of the coal. This has been done for years and years. Uh, mountaintop removal is overall is about 5% of U.S. coal production. West Virginia, I believe it's like something more like 30%. So you do this massive geoengineering. You know, you change the landscape. You remove the top of a mountain. So if, if anybody's opposed to geoengineering, you know, you'd think they'd be opposed to mountaintop. Ask them about mountaintop removal for coal purposes. So why do they do this? Well, they say it's safer because underground mines are notoriously dangerous. They're very labor intensive. With mountaintop mining, you use explosives and you use heavy equipment. There's, uh, you can actually extract coal. You can reduce the number of workers by two to three times. So therefore, the cost of getting the coal, extracting the coal, is actually about two and a half times lower with mountaintop removal. It's also very high-grade coal, low-sulfur coal. So when the um, U.S. Clean Air Act put limits, the EPA limits on sulfur, when you burn coal in power plants, it causes a sulfur emission. So sulfur emissions are lower using the coal from mountaintop removal. So it can be done much faster, it can get extract large amounts of coal much, much faster. So it does have all of these advantages, but it's completely devastating to the ecology of the region, to the environment, to the uh, biodiversity in the region, you know, you're removing mountains, you know, there's a huge aesthetic, you know, loss of sense of place, especially for people living in the region. And not only is the whole landscape changed, but people living, communities near the mountaintop removal have huge cancer incidence rates. Uh, they're breathing very, very polluted air. They're in contact with very polluted water. And there's enormous cancer clusters, if you like, in these regions. So there's huge numbers of drawbacks to people in those regions, not to mention the emissions into the atmosphere from burning the coal. Thank you, Paul, for uh, mentioning all those things. You know, that uh, book, not sure who was the author? John Grissom. John Grissom, uh, so yeah. Green Mountain. Yeah, yeah very well I... known uh, fiction author. And there was a movie, I, I doing the, the little research I've done on this topic, I learned that there was a movie produced in 2011. Yeah, in 2011, directed and written by Bill Haney. It was a feature-length documentary film. And uh, what I found interesting, I didn't, I didn't actually see the movie. But what I found interesting was that uh, it uh, was based on Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s 2005 book, called Crimes Against Nature. And actually it, it did feature Robert F. Kennedy Jr. in the movie. The other thing is, is that I know that this practice has been going on since around the 1960s. It started in the 60s, but as you mentioned, it really became uh, more popular as the demand for low sulfur coal went up during the uh, energy crisis in 73 and then in 79. And as you say, it is a cheaper way to extract coal because it doesn't require as many people. It actually caused a decrease in the employment, quite a thing. And it's all mechanized. And of course, they're using explosives to do a lot of the work of rubbleizing the, the overburden and a big, large machines to move the material aside to get at the seam. So anyways, I'm going to uh, give it back to Peter. Peter, I found your revealing of what's happening in Canada very interesting. Yeah, uh, thanks, Paul, for mentioning the air pollution, which, of course, I forgot to mention. And uh, globally, th this is huge. There are over 10 million people worldwide 
premature death killed by fossil fuels. This is specifically fossil fuels. And of course, most of that is coal. The vast majority is coal. Um, and if that's not a crime, I mean, that's a horrendous crime, right? 10 million people killed a year. And at the same time, we're destroying the planet, you know, with the same devil's fuel substance. It, this is a very important paper. So I mentioned the name. It was published in 2019. And the lead author was Khan, Khan Voha. It's a very, very important paper. You'll be shocked, no doubt, to hear that the number is 10.2 million a year. Well, as the years have rolled by, every research on the how many people are killed prematurely by coal has just gone up. WMO has done it several times. And heavy metals, yeah, um, carcinogens, mercury, as Paul has mentioned. Also, radioactivity, you know. There's a strong feeling among environmentalists. I can understand it. I had the same feeling many years ago, you know, that we uh, we don't want to uh, use um, uh, nuclear fission for production of, of power. So w when the debate was going on, I remember picking up somebody who said, well, you know, uh, coal mining produces um, uh, radioactive pollution as well. I should mention just quickly, coal power, one big advantage, of course, um, to industry is that it's a very high energy tense fossil fuel. So it puts out a huge amount of energy for a relatively small amount of weight. In fact, you have to do that for making steel in this case, but also any heavy manufacturing. So um, uh, over the decades, the, the competition uh, for high energy tense uh, power has been between coal and uh, nuclear. Um, there, there's nothing else. There will be in the future with renewables. They will get into high energy dense, but uh, we're making the wrong choice. Um, in both cases, because we're not really uh, building the new fission plants, so, I mean, one in China, one in India, and we really ought to be so that we can completely close down all the coal industry in the world. And we have to completely shut down all the coal industry, literally, if we are to have a future, let alone a livable future. I mean, there's no future with burning coal. So that would be my my uh, my final comment on uh, the evils of burning coal. Oh boy! Thank you, Peter, for sharing those aspects of the uh, coal extraction, the air pollution, and the uh, number of people killed uh, through air pollution uh, on a per annum basis, uh, being ten, approximately ten million. Also, you mentioned the radioactivity of coal as well, which I found interesting. I'm wondering, Paul, if you can share some more about uh, what you learned from uh, reading this book. So, you know, we tend to think of coal as being, you know, one one thing, but there's all, of course, there's all types of different grades of coal. And Peter's been mentioning the metallurgical coal, which is basically, it's got the highest carbon content, I believe. So when it burns, it burns at the highest temperatures, which are the temperatures required for the blast furnaces for doing steel work, creating steels and, and copper metals, uh, smelting, etc. They use this uh, very, very high grade coal. And as I mentioned, the I mean, the Appalachians geologically used to be a much higher mountain range millions of years ago, almost uh, rivaling the height of the uh, Himalayas, actually. And it's a very, very old uh, mountain range, so erosion has whittled it down to what we have present day. What we're mining, these coal seams, were created under very high temperatures and pressures because there was, you know, uh, literally kilometers of rock above them in, in the deep past, which allowed those high pressures to be reached and these seems to be laid out. So it's a very, very high grade coal, very, very low sulfur content. You know, as Peter mentioned, there, you know, there's reasons why through human history, we've proceeded the way we have on an energy basis. You know, we started burning, before we had mining, we would burn wood to provide, you know, heat and energy. And then as technology advanced and advanced in quotes, of course, you know, we learned different mining techniques. We invented the steam engine, which allowed us to pump out mines and go to deeper mines. 
right? So we started, you know, this is, was basically the start of the Industrial Revolution in 1750, where these techniques took off. The technologies allowed us to extract vast amounts of carbon from deep in the ground. And, you know, after coal, it started, then it went to oil. And then, you know, much more recently, people talked about the natural gas, the methane as bridge fuels. And of course, we know that methane leakages, when there are a few, when <clears throat> five to 10%, which they are commonly, then natural gas is no better than burning coal on an emissions basis. It's hard, you know, you can follow sort of human history and development, and you can see why these things have happened. But we know how harmful it is to our planet, how harmful these fossil fuel fuels are to all life on the planet. And it's turning out to be quite difficult for a society to, to transition off these. In fact, we're still subsidizing the fossil fuel industry at record high rate. Up to recently, China's building a new coal plant every every uh, you know week or so. What there was a climate conference in Katowice, Poland, a few years ago, um, and Poland's a huge coal producing country, and there were huge exhibits. I wasn't there, but I heard and seen photos of these exhibits, huge fancy exhibits put by the coal companies on, you know, all the different stages of coal mining and coal processing and so on. We still have lots of mining going on, lots of coal burnings, and we need to get away from these as soon as possible in order to preserve life on the planet. You know, not to mention all of the local and regional effects of, of removing the tops of mountains, you know, with, uh, you know, heavy, heavy equipment. And we're not just removing the tops of mountains, but we're, we're taking a very, you know, lovely place with topography, mountains and valley streams and all of the wildlife, biodiversity, flora and fauna, and we're basically leveling it, right? We're filling in the valleys with the mountaintops and completely messing up the ecology, the water systems, you know, the, the microclimates, everything. We're, we're completely geoengineering these regions, you know, and then they have these programs. They say, okay, we're going to reclaim. Well, how do you reclaim? I mean, if you don't do anything, basically grass is growing in that region over time. Uh, you need at least four or five, six feet of soil in order for trees to grow that soil, you know, needs to build up over long periods of time. So, you know, it's pretty much on human timescales. It's a permanent change of the landscape. So it's, uh, you know, amazing to me that this is still going on. It's still being talked about. There was a House subcommittee meeting in 2019 on mountaintop removal. Should they be doing it or should they not be doing it? I mean, after it's being done, since, as you mentioned, Charles, since the 60s already. So, yeah, it's just kind of mind boggling that, um, you know, sort of how, how humans can develop and apply technology to completely transform beautiful landscapes in the Appalachian Mountains to completely flat, lifeless areas with mountaintop removal. Thank you, Paul for that information. And uh, thank you for this topic suggestion. And uh, yeah, it's interesting that, you know, the suggestion came through your reading of fiction, which was uh, really, I mean, fiction, of course, based on the reality of uh, this process of mountaintop removal, uh, mining. Yeah, there's a lot of things you mentioned here, you know, the industrial revolution, development of the steam engines, and the gradual evolution to um, forms of fossil fuel that emit slightly less carbon, yes, like natural gas, as you mentioned, but of course, that is nullified by the fact that methane being a very potent greenhouse gas uh, with, I think, uh, 80 to 100 times more potent in the first uh, 20 years, that's kind of a nullified, essentially. And so though those are all really good points. Yeah, and I guess the other challenge with the coal is it's very much an integral part of steel making still. And so this high grade, high carbon uh, coke that they use to make steel, I mean, 
I know that they are developing uh, alternative steel making processes that use electricity and hydrogen to replace that process, but apparently it's very expensive. But I think in Canada, they are working on one of those projects. Uh, I think it's up in uh, Northern Ontario, they're, they're working on one of those. So this has been a very uh, interesting conversation. And, you know, thank you for joining us here today. And if you feel uh, like you've learned something from watching this program, please give us a like. And if you haven't done so already, consider subscribing to our channel. And we look forward to seeing you at the next Climate Emergency Forum. 